Hi everybody, Roland Martin here and welcome to my YouTube channel. Uh, you know, over the years I'm asked by a lot of comments, you know, things like, what's my favorite lure of all times? Well, I'm gonna, I've explained this many times, but I don't know if I've gotten into the detail of it. My favorite lure of all times is this five inch 297 green pumpkin Cinco, okay? Now, there's dozens of ways to rig this, and there's dozens of ways to fish it for all the applications all over the country. So that's what we're gonna call, talk about today. Not just my way, but your way. Okay, I'm also asked at the boat shows and the things that in the comments in the YouTube is, is what's the nation's, what's the number one bait in the whole world? Well, the number one plastic bait in the whole world is the uh, Cinco for bass. Five inch Cinco is the world's leading bass lure. Okay, so, so that's all good. Now, you might live in Connecticut, you might live in California, and you're saying, well, golly day, Roland Martin, he's a power fisherman from Florida. That's all he can do. No, 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 no. Yeah, you got it all wrong. I started up fishing worms and plastic worms similar to the Cinco in Maryland back in the 60s, and I was on the very ground floor of plastic worm fishing, and I know a lot about plastic worm fishing from places like Lake Mead and the crystal waters of, of, the, of the western uh, lakes and uh, the Appalachian lakes, the Tennessee River lakes. I fish all over the country as a tournament fisherman. I fished 40 years on the tournament circuit and did extremely well in all the locations around the country on the Cinco. Well, not only the Cinco, but the, the plastic worms that preceded the Cinco. But now that we have the Cinco, let's talk about the five inch Cinco, the number one lure. Okay, first of all, let's talk about the most universal form of a plastic worm that you could ever have. Let's talk about the five inch Cinco. Let's talk about it uh, from Connecticut to California, all over the country. Okay, this is what I'm gonna recommend. The, the number one thing that I have found the most effective in most of the lakes that I fish that have occasional uh, a bush to throw to or occasional stomp, some rocks, you know, just kind of a halfway clear leg, okay. The first, the first thing I have is I have on this hook, this is a 4 aught EWG. It's a special hook. I just want to show you this new hook. It's so sharp. This is the new sharp hook that's so, so it's, it's a rave right now. It's a special surgical steel. It's stronger than ever. It's a thinner wire, but it's a stronger hook. It's a Gamagatsu, uh, it's a hybrid shape, tournament grade. It's the hybrid worm hook. It's just very superior. Okay, that's the hook I'm using, 4 aught. Along with that, let's, let's just talk about this whole setup right here. I have a screw-in weight, an eighth of an ounce, or that's actually a sixteenth of an ounce. Okay, let's, let's start with the hook. Four-aught tournament grade hook. It's a sixteenth of an ounce screw-in weight, okay, and we'll talk about that in a second. I'm going to take the Hosinko and I'm going to put it on a little bit farther down the, sh the hook, a little bit more uh, into the worm, another quarter of an inch to accommodate the screw part of the screw and weight, okay, to pull it up on the on the shank of the hook. Now I have a longer distance from <laughs> when I get this screw and weight ready to go. I can screw it into the, the front of the worm. This is so cool, the screw and weights. There's a couple other ways to go. And then I'll show you those other ways. Now that see there's a little bit more distance now between the it's about an eighth of an inch diff, distance between the bottom of that screw thing on the weight and the, and the head of the hook. It gives you a little bit, I'll bury that hook like that. Okay, now rigged with that is 14 pound. Now I have regular monofilament because for years I had caught thousands upon thousands upon thousands of fish on 14 pound monofilament. The rage now is, is fluorocarbon. But let me tell you a little bit about fluorocarbon. Fluorocarbon's kinky, it's harder to cast and it, it's, it's actually a little bit better, has a little bit less stretch, it sinks more. So there's some good and bad things about, about fluorocarbon. It's harder to cast, it, it, but yet it, it sets the hook maybe, maybe a little bit better. It could possibly be a little bit uh, uh, more resistant to scratches, so it's probably a little tougher line. The disadvantage is it's five times more expensive than monofilament. So uh, a 14-pound monofilament is what I use. Now, I, I buy my monofilament really cheap. Look at this. I buy big spools of monofilament. In this case, that's uh, 1,200 yards, and it really doesn't cost much. I don't know what, it's just, it's just a dollar or so to fill up the whole reel. So it's not a whole lot of money. Now, along with that, if I wanted to go to 14-pound test line, 
I could go to the fluorocarbon 14, and that costs quite a bit more. The fluorocarbon 14, which I don't have right now, I don't have a spool, here's some 17, it costs about, uh, you know, 10 times more expensive than the monofilament. But again, it, it sinks more, and it, uh, it's better to set the hook with, and it's more invisible in the water. So that's why everybody's using fluorocarbon, but not everybody. I'm a diehard, I'm a, maybe old school, I use a lot of monofilament because it's easy to cast, and it's just a foolproof line, and I have all the confidence in the world in a 14 pound test line. I tie it with a Palomar knot. Now I've shown you how to tie the Palomar knot. Okay, now on this, on this line, th this rod is just what I really, it's a seven foot one rod, medium heavy action, seven foot rod. It's a favorite rod, and it's a favorite reel. It's eight to one reel, and I have an exquisite drag on there. Now this is 14 pound test line, so I wanna have about a medium drag, not real tight drag. That's about four or five pounds of drag. That's probably all you'd want in setting the hook. Now here's another thing to remember. When you get that bass up to the boat on a, on a drag, say half the line, line test, be sure to want to loosen the drag when you get the bass to the boat because that, that, that's when they can pull it out. I mean, you have to kind of loosen your drag system. I start with a tight drag because there's a lot of line stretch. I can set the hook good with a, with a heavy drag, but then as I get the bass right up to the boat, I might back that drag off just a little teeny bit. Okay, that's number one. Now, that's the number one way of fishing in the whole country. Okay, let's talk about spinning tackle. You know, you think of me as a power fisherman. No, he uses nothing but uh, casting tackle. I, I use spinning tackle so much when I was a kid that look at that thump, lump on my th uh, little finger and there's another lump on that finger. And the reason why the lumps are there is that I would hold the spinning rod in that, in that hand and I would hold the, the base of the reel against that, against that uh, finger and it made a lump there, it made a lump here. So I, that's how much I've used spinning tackle. I'm, a, I'm an expert with spinning tackle, okay? I just prefer casting tackle for the simple reason that it's a little bit more powerful. I can use a little bit heavier line and I get a little bit better accuracy. But as far as spinning tackle, I get great distance with spinning tackle. I can skip it better with skip spinning tackle. There's a lot of applications I use with spinning tackle. And plus, if I want to use light tackle, like I'm fishing Lake Mead in, in Nevada in the crystal clear waters in 20 and 30 feet of water, I might want to go to say six pound line on a light spinning rod like this one. Okay, let me show you this rod. Here's one that's set up a little bit different. It's it's set up with with 20 pound braid. I got 20 pound braid, and I have a, a double uni knot. And on that double uni knot, I have some 10 pound test fluorocarbon. 10 pound test fluorocarbon. Okay, a nice little leader. And I've shown you how to tie that double uni knot. That's a pretty big deal. On that hook, it's the same hook as I showed you before. It's a four aught EWG, that special tournament grade hook, but. It's a little bit different. On this one, I have a bobber stop, just because I'm gonna show you three or four ways of rigging up a Texas rigged a worm, uh, but with screw weights, with bobber stops, with toothpicks. I don't like a, slip, a, a, sl a sliding weight. The reason why I don't like a sliding weight, let me just show you something, what happens with a sliding weight. Now, right now, here is a plastic worm, and it's gonna come up to a, to a stick in the water. It comes up to the stick in the water, it pulls over it like this, the weight doesn't slide down the line. The late, the late, the weight pulls it down. It pulls it down. The whole thing sinks into the into the water. If you had the slip weight to slip, say you had this back like this, and you had the whole thing like that. Watch what happens now. now the barber stops away from it now. Watch what happens. It comes up. It comes up. It comes over the stick. It comes down like this. Up. Oh, the slip weight went down. The worm's still on the other side of the branch. The slip weight's down, and you think you're feeling the worm down there. It's actually you're just feeling the weight. So to correct the problem, you slide the barber stop all the way down on the leader, all the way down against the slip weight, and now the whole thing comes over the log, comes over the branch, comes over the rock, and the whole thing falls in a uniform fashion. And that's, that is why you use a, a some kind of a restriction to restrict the, the slip weight from sliding down the leader. Now, I showed you the, the screw-in weight, that's one way. I showed you the bobber stop, that, I, that you can get bobber stops real easily. I have thousands of bobber stops. I'm gonna show you the third way. Okay, for the old school way of, of attaching the, uh, the sinker to the line is we used a toothpick and we'd put the line through the, to through the, uh, 
Then there's two ways to do it. You go through the front of it, it's one way, like this, and break it off there, okay? Only problem is it's hard to get that little thing out. I like to come in the back of the, of the weight. That's even better. I come in the back of the weight right here with the line going through there, and I'll, and I'll push the toothpick in as far as I can, break it off. I go through the back where well, it didn't stay in there because the, the, line, the line wasn't there to hold it. Anyway, that happens to be a, a 3 16 ounce weight. It's, it's pegged that way with a toothpick, and that works perfectly fine. That works perfectly fine. Okay. Let's talk about let's talk about my power fishing. You know, you, you talk about pl plastic worm fishing there. You can talk about a wacky rig. You can talk about flipping a, a Cinco with a big heavy weight. You can talk about a, a Carolina rig. All these are applications of a, of, a, of a Cinco. But the number one way of fishing a Cinco is the Texas rig. And that's what I'm really working on today and all the different ways to, to rig up a Texas rig. Okay, let's let's look up Let's try one other combination here. Here is, here is one of my favorites. <laughs> I'm a power fisherman, you know that. I live here in Florida and I have these great big bass down here in Florida. So now this setup for, for me in Florida is a little bit different. I'm using that same good EWG four rod hook, that big tournament grade hook that I said was so good. Okay. I'm also using a slip weight. I can go to the sale. I happen to have the 16th of an ounce slip weight. Right here, okay, good, good. Okay, 16th of an ounce, I come through the head of the worm the same, same way, a little bit farther down. I'm gonna get a new worm just to kind of show you. And I'm gonna get, instead of the 297 green pumpkin, I'm gonna get a, uh, a different color worm. This is a 021, it's a black with a blue flake. And that's a good, good worm as well. I'm coming a little bit farther down the hook than normal because I had that screw in weight. Okay, pull it down in position, bury the hook in the proper position. And now, when I screw in that weight, I have, a, like I say, about an eighth of an inch difference between the, the, the worm the hook, the actual hook, and, and the weight is about an eighth of an ounce apart. So there's a little bit of play right there. And I'm throwing 30 to 50 pound braid because here in Florida we have big masses of hydrilla big, big, big cypress trees, all kind of bushes, reeds of all sorts. Reeds are just terribly hard to get fish out of. You need 50 pound braid for sure if there's heavy reeds because they're so, they're so heavy, the, the reeds can sometimes break a, a 65 pound test line. So that's, that's what you have to have. Okay, now the rod that I'm using is about the same thing. This happens to be a 7.3. It's a little bit heavier rod. I'm going to the next size heavier rod. It's a medium heavy action because I'm using braid and heavier cover. Before, on the regular rod, I had, uh, it was a seven foot, uh, a medi kind of a medium action. This is a seven three medium heavy action, a little bit bigger, a little bit heavier rod. And on the bottom, look at this, I have the, I have the little the cushion button. The cushion button is so I can get it into my stomach and if I'm power fishing, like I'm throwing into the reeds and lily pads, I want to really crank them out of there. So when I make my cast, I either pitch it in there, kind of pitch it or flip it, or I just make a cast, and again, I put the rod, and let's, let's see how I have, it, have the rod down in my stomach like this. I have it, have it in a strike position right here. So that's so important to have the rod anchored when you set the hook on, say, a big heavy rod with braid like this one. Okay, so that's a braid combination that's just, just rock solid. And I noticed this, so here's the whole thing about braid. Do you need a leader with braid? Well. Here in Florida, you have a lot of tannic water. It's real dark water. It's, it's not the kind of water that, that normally uh, uh, is very visible. So we get away with braid because it's darker water. It's not the clear water of the Tennessee River. It's not the clear water of the western chain of the Colorado River Basin or Havasu and Lake Mead and Lake Powell. No, there you need light line, you need light fluorocarbons lines. And you can use fluorocarbon on a casting reel. In fact, when we fished the St. Lawrence River, my son Scott and I fished on the Pan American Games. All we fished was, uh, was fluorocarbon and that crystal clear water. We could see the smallmouth down 20 feet deep underneath us, so we needed that clear line. So now here's my rule of thumb. A 16th of an ounce, if the wind's practically no wind, that's what I'm doing. If there's zero wind at all and I can get away with it, I'm gonna throw the Cinco with no weight, absolutely free, free of weight. That's in the real shallow areas at a foot or so deep. But if there's any depth to it, three or four or five feet, I use that 16th of an ounce. It just keeps it gliding just perfect. 
Okay, the wind blows five or six miles an hour. Okay, I might go to an eighth of an ounce weight. I, and I have screw-in weights that are all different sizes. I have uh, eighth of an ounce weights. And I have uh, three sixteenths of an ounce weights. Okay, once the wind blows about 10 miles an hour, I'll go to three sixteenths. That's a little bit heavier. And once it's over, say, 10 miles an hour to say 15 miles an hour, I'm, go I'm definitely going to be a quarter of an ounce. Now, a quarter of an ounce gets to be pretty heavy. You kind of destroy the action of the of the worm once you once you get into that heavy wind. But I have I have these screw-in weights, for example, the screw-in weights. That's a three sixteenths ounce screw-in weight. And I have a half ounce screw-in weight. Here's a here's actually a uh, no, this one is a, actually a tungsten quarter ounce screw-in weight. And then I have just regular weights. Okay, when you take say a quarter ounce, here's the quarter ounce regular weight. I'd, I'd probably either peg it with a toothpick or use a barber stopper, either way. And finally, when the wind really gets to blowing, I might have to go all the way up to, just say, a three-eighths of an ounce. A three-eighths of an ounce weight's pretty heavy. And uh, say now, it's really honking. We're talking about winds that's blowing 15 or 20 miles an hour. And when it gets around 20, all you can do is put these really heavy weights on. And you kind of destroy your, your action when you put a heavy weight on. Look at this big old heavy weight. Here's a, here's a half ounce. Actually, it's a little heavier than a half ounce, five, six, five, eight, seven ounce. All of a sudden, the wind's blowing like 20 miles an hour, and you got this great big five eighths of an ounce screw in weight. Well, you can barely, it's just dra dragging the bottom, you can just barely make a cast. Well, I tell you, it's getting to be really a difficult situation, worm fishing in the heavy wind. And finally, let's face it, folks, when the wind blows 25 miles an hour, and you're trying to pl fish a plastic worm, you're wasting your time. Go home. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's not, not worth the effort. 25 mile an hour winds or better, it's just not worm fishing. Just something else to do. Go home and watch television. Anyway, folks, I hope I've explained a little bit about fishing the, the, the uh, mighty five inch Cinco on a Texas rigged worm, showing you this spinning application and the casting application, the braid, the uh, uh, the leaders, hey, I hope you can be a better fisherman for it. And that's the number one lure in the whole country at 5-Inch Cinco. Hey, you got to get on the bandwagon. It's the deal. We'll see you again soon. Hey, thanks for watching.